adaptation research. And she's come, collaborated with research teams um, uh, internationally and published over 200 peer reviews. So um, we're very grateful for Jill to join us today and share her expertise um, on um, de-implementing low care, low value care. So um, over to Francis, uh, Jill, sorry, <laughs> Professor Francis. <laughs> so um, if you'd like to just share your screen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for making the effort to be here today. I'm just gonna share. Is that working for you all? Yes. I hope it is. Okay, lovely. Um, thanks very much. So why is it so difficult? How can it be done? Now, I'm aware that some of you um, are very, very fine implementation researchers, and I do apologize if I'm going to tell you things that you already know backwards, but I know it's a quite a, a diverse uh, group that comes to this meeting. So I'm hoping there might be something for everyone here, but um, um, yeah, I'm just very much aware, aware that I'm talking to experts. And so um, let's just uh, hope that we're sharing some of our common interests here. So the plan, I'm just uh, going to talk about how do we know there's a problem with low value care? Or why is it uh, so difficult to de-implement? And how can de-implementation be done? And obviously, in this uh, time that we have together today, we can only uh, start to scratch the surface of those um, quite deep questions. But, well, but let's have a go. Uh, first of all, let's define our terms. Low value care is defined as any practice, investigation or procedure that lacks evidence, may cause harm or provides little benefit. And those clinicians amongst you, I know, will be aware that this, uh, this is uh, quite a long term problem, quite a, 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 um, a, quite a pervasive problem in healthcare systems. Let's just look at then... Um, uh, what is the evidence that of evidence practice gaps in general? And normally, uh, and for the, as you can see, 1998 from the last uh, more than two decades, evidence practice gaps tend to have been classified into two kinds. One is the failure to deliver recommended care. And that's the bar here. We would like that bar to be all dark, but you can see that um, only about 50% of the time do patients receive uh, recommended care. Now, the low value care piece is the delivery of contraindicated care. And of course, we would like the whole of that bar to be pale, but uh, worryingly, over 20% of the time, patients receive care uh, that is contraindicated, that is of no benefit or potentially even harmful and certainly wasteful. Uh, now, this finding, that these, this dual finding has been replicated across many clinical areas across all health systems where it's been um, investigated. It's a pervasive and a global problem. Uh, now, although that implies that there are two kinds of care, two kinds of care gaps, I would like to propose that, that there are at least five kinds of care gaps. One is the slow uptake of new interventions that are clinically effective. And when we talk about uh, this kind of care gap, this is what people tend to think implementation science is about. We need to speed up the uptake of effective interventions. So initiating new, uh, new care. Um, however, um, I want to argue that that's only um, one of five kinds of care gaps. The premature or continued uptake of interventions that are shown to be ineffective, wasteful or even harmful, that is the delivery of low value care, is, as I've argued, a, a massive problem. One example here is the use of acid suppression uh, suppression medication for infants who cry a lot on the assumption that what they're experiencing um, is a gastric uh, reflux problem. Um, that's indicated to be, uh, no, it, it, it's one of those do not do uh, recommendations that have come out recently. Still, uh, acid suppression medication for infants is prescribed quite a lot. Then there's the failure to keep up with gradually emerging evidence about existing interventions. My example here is that uh, we now know that transfusion is overused, particularly in, in hospital contexts. 
Uh, then there's, of course, unwarranted, unwarranted variation in care, where um, for all sorts of reasons, uh, vulnerable groups tend to get uh, uh, less uh, high quality care than um, the less vulnerable groups. And of course, this leads to health inequities. So unwarranted variation is another kind of care back and care gap. And then there's the failure to keep up with changes in the ethos of care. This isn't so much about doing uh, what the evidence suggests, it's about doing the right thing, for example, person-centred care. So we've got a range of types of care gaps and you'll see uh, from, from my suggestions here that, uh, that three of them at least uh, involve delivery of low value care. So there's another spin uh, on this and that is about the, the cost of low value care and, and the waste in healthcare systems, which can ill afford to waste their resources. And so a more up-to-date uh, re uh, reference here is uh, 2019 in JALA, Shrank and colleagues identified the financial costs of care gaps. And again, they made this sort of dual uh, um, uh, uh, classification failure of care delivery was is very very costly around about 100 billion in US dollars and over treatment or low value care or uh, you know getting up towards 100 billion in the US now if you extrapolate these figures to the Australian context we've still got over 2 billion um, uh, dollars arguably um, per year uh, that can be attributed to over treatment or delivery of unnecessary um, interventions and procedures. So this is a massive problem, and it's a massive problem that affects not only uh, patient outcomes, but wastage within the healthcare system. And a little bit closer to home, a very nice paper in the MJA in 2012 uh, used very systematic methods, including retrospective review of method medical records to identify this sort of low value care delivery in the Australian context. And some of their many examples were for back pain, uh, and Simon French, you know all about this and have led work on this, uh, still uh, at that time, a quarter of patient visits resulted in a referral for imaging when that's not recommended. And a, a, another, you know, the old, the old hoary problem of antibiotic prescribing, decades and decades after we know it shouldn't be done, there's still overuse of antibiotics uh, for, uh, con for conditions that won't really, uh, for which they won't really make much difference. So this is an enduring problem. Uh, we've also got the problem of overdiagnosis, not just overtreatment. Uh, and this very, uh, very nice um, quote here, you know, uh, the, the notion that, that uh, healthcare improves health uh, can be challenged then by its uh, propensity to harm the healthy. And they give three types of uh, examples. One, screening, pro screening programs detecting early cancers that will never cause symptoms or death. These are quite controversial, I need to say, but arguably these are overdiagnosis issues. Sensitive diagnostic technologies that identify abnormalities that are so tiny that they'll remain benign. And the widening of disease definitions, meaning that people at ever lower risks receive permanent medical labels and lifelong treatments that will fail to benefit many of them. So the problem of overdiagnosis um, it, it is included in this low value care uh, concept. So let's go back to our types of, uh, of care gaps, premature uptake. Um, now this is a really, uh, a really an issue that's dear to my heart. And so and a lot of it is technology driven. And so I would say to people who are excited by technology, let's not get overexcited about innovations that offer thrilling new kit. And I would also say to people, uh, don't assume that something that has high face validity is clinically effective and therefore should be implemented immediately. Uh, we know uh, how to identify clinical effectiveness. It's through randomised studies. And, and nevertheless, there are some interventions that have very high face validity. Uh, people love them. They make sense. And so they'll seek to implement them straight away. And I need to just, just mention funding bodies. And it, when I came back to the UK um, a year and a half ago and looked at the funding bodies' um, uh, requirements, 
I was rather shocked to see that in the same breath, we're supposed to show the funding body uh, that we're delivering or building up uh, and, and, um, and testing in innovations. And in the same breath, we're supposed to show them how we're going to implement this into practice. We know that it's not appropriate to implement into practice until you've got randomised level evidence, until you've got replications of those randomised trials, until you've got synthesis of that evidence. And yet, Funding bodies are encouraging and rewarding premature implementation. And to me, um, that verges on the unethical. And um, so I always mention the problem of funding bodies in these sorts of talks. I know, again, I'm being controversial, but hey, sack me. Um, <laughs> so then we've got continued delivery of uh, innovations that have sh been shown to be ineffective, wasteful, or even harmful. And Rochelle Bookbinder, and you might, might know this, and Ian Harris have been on this case for quite a long time. And one great example of this is knee arthroscopy, which has been shown uh, to have no benefit um, other than, or it's no, it does no better than placebo surgery. And there's even a possibility that it results in an earlier joint replacement uh, than placebo. And yet we've known this for about 20 years, and yet knee arth arthroscopy is continuing to be performed, although I believe that Medicare has just stopped uh, rewarding that financial. Um, and in another, uh, another uh, publication, Ian Harris has suggested that unfortunately our health system doesn't prioritise or incentivise weight loss, but it does incentivise surgical interventions. So we've got to consider how much of this uh, low value care is being, uh, is being encouraged by the financial rewards that, uh, that uh, people are given. More on that in a little while. Uh, and so Rochelle Bookbinder and Ian Harris last year, you might know about this, published a book for the general readership called Hypocrisy. And in the, pre in the uh, 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 prologue to this book, Norman Vaughan uh, wrote the, the, the very um, catchy phrase, one of the hardest things for a doctor to do is nothing. It's quite hard to stop uh, delivering care that patients expect and that you've done for many, uh, many times before. Um, and so, you know, we need the implementation. We need active strategies to help people stop uh, doing some of these things. Um, so what about the incentivization argument? Um, so Murphy and Parchman um, in 2018 had a look at this uh, issue of incentivization within healthcare systems. Uh, again, they're arguing that it's, this is a pressing problem globally. It raises costs, causes patient harm, and potentially interferes with de delivery of high value care. But they looked systematically at the difference between health systems in countries where there's a fee for service uh, uh, financial setup, for example, um, the USA to an extent, Australia and Canada, and compared that with systems like the UK, where there's much less uh, direct incentivization of, uh, of care delivery. And from these cross country comparisons, they identified that low value care is not higher in fee-for-service, in unrestricted fee-for-service systems. And when you do make a financial restriction within that system, they observed that it tends to lower both low-value low and high-value care. So the quick fix, the potential quick fix of fixing up the fee-for-service problem is not necessarily the whole of the solution to this problem. So now here's a... Um, here's a um, a forward look, you'll notice I'm uh, estimating that Wiley is going to publish this book in 2023, but um, our friends and colleagues um, in Canada and Europe are editors of this book on how to reduce overuse and uh, with colleagues um, around the globe, I've uh, just written this chapter, why is it so hard to change behaviour and how can we influence it that's going to be part of uh, um, this book. So this is what I argue in this uh, in this book. Why is it so hard to change? Well, we know a, a sort of a truism that past behaviour is the best predictor of future behaviour. It's quite simply easier to do something that you've done before. Uh, and so behaviour is therefore resistant to change. 
you add to that the prob the problem of pot the potential for uh, incentivization in lots of ways, not just financial incentives. There might be incentives uh, because patients are pleased when you uh, do more rather than do less. GPs might think that their patients are going to come back um, if they if they uh, prescribe an antibiotic. They don't get what they want, they'll go to another doctor within this healthcare system. And sometimes then there are also, there's the carrot and the stick, there's sometimes um, um, punishments for not delivering um, uh, the care that is in accord with evidence. Of course, punishment is, is, a, is a, um, an intervention of last resort. It's arguably not ethical. We need to protect uh, clinical autonomy and clinical judgment because there are exceptions um, in every in every uh, field, and so we need to retain uh, the, the the capacity, of course, of clinicians to make to make their own clinical judgments. So the carrot and stick um, model is not necessarily uh, the solution. But rewards will nonetheless sustain behaviours, uh, even if they are behaviours that we would prefer to discourage. Um, so let's go on to the habit model. So past that, having performed a behaviour a lot in the past is not the only um, criterion for calling it a habit. We know that habits are contextually cued. So if you've performed the behaviour many times in the same context at the same time, then uh, it, it can be defined as a habit. And habits are particularly resistant to change. Breaking habits is a field of investigation all of its own, but contextually triggered behaviours in the healthcare setting are particularly resistant, and that's uh, something that we need to bear in mind. And, of course, another reason why it's so challenging behaviour is that Healthcare professionals are not just individuals, they work as a part of a healthcare team uh, where there are, there are expectations and social norms within that healthcare team. Patient expectations can drive these uh, behaviours as well. And then all of these sit within, of course, an organisational context, which might make change quite difficult. So there's a number of reasons why it's difficult to change behaviour and therefore difficult to change clinical practice. So, could it be that implementation science can come to the rescue here? Let's just uh, have a look at the definition of implementation science. And I'm taking this from um, an earlier version of the website uh, from um, the journal Implementation Science, which is the premier journal in the field, Impact Factor over seven now. So it's uh, it's uh, really quite hard to get published in this um, in this field. You'll notice that within the, the on the homepage of this uh, journal, we had the notion that um, implementation research is a scientific study of methods to promote the systematic uptake of proven clinical treatments. And a later addition to this uh, page was the notion of the implementation of in interventions that are of uh, low or no clinical benefit. Uh, notice also that we're referring here to the scientific study of methods and, and the, the question of what makes implementation scientific is quite an interesting one. I was asked that in an interview uh, a few weeks back. And I guess um, lots of ways to answer that question, but the scientific study of uptake and de-implementation uh, is about uh, being very clear about what our assumptions are and being very clear about testing those assumptions using robust empirical methods. So a lot of people will, will assume that they know how to implement and therefore also how to de-implement. But let's put all of these assumptions to an empirical test. You know, we're all scientists. Let's retain our scepticism until we have evidence. And this, just as we do that in clinical practice, we need to do that in implementation practice. So some, um, some broad top-down system level strategies that may or may not have been subjected to empirical tests, empirical evaluation, are quite often used, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be used, they're great first steps. And of course, one of, the, one of these top-down strategies is health system policy. Uh, another is, as we've discussed, financial incentives. Uh, we've also got clinical practice guidelines at the national level. These are top-down strategies that uh, uh, um, aim to inform clinical practice in an evidence-based way. 
of course, we've got continuing medical education, and that's quite yeah, quite important. We've even got things like league tables, and of course, you may have uh, you may be aware that there are some negative, unintended consequences of league tables, like gaming. Uh, but these are all examples of top-down strategies that might people might consider to be no-brainers, but they're not the whole story. How do we know they're not the whole story? Because care gaps continue despite all, uh, all of these being in place for many decades. There are other things that we need to do. Maybe we need to look at the point of care and we're using a bottom-up strategy as well. One other top-down strategy that should be mentioned when we're talking about um, um, low-value care is the choosing wisely movement. Um, you're probably aware of it. Uh, it started in the USA in 2015 got to Australia in, uh, sorry, it started in the USA in 2012, got to Australia in 2015. Uh, there's now a movie, a, a Choosing Wisely movement in uh, 20 different countries, which is very exciting. And it's a conversation um, uh, about uh, the need for de-implementation. And it encourages conversations between clinicians and patients uh, including empowering patients to ask some questions about their treatments, uh, to encourage that conversation so that we don't just automatically move to delivering a practice or a, or a treatment that, uh, that may be a, an example of low-value care. Um, so, again, this is, a, this is fantastic. This movement is brilliant. There's a lot of people engaged with it. Again, because we're dealing with uh, implementation science, we need to ask that scientific question, what is the evidence that it makes a difference? Um, so uh, just uh, for, for the part of that website, we're talking about uh, a movement that's trying to reduce unnecessary tests, treatments, and procedures, and there's a toolkit there. But let's look at the evidence uh, for a choosing wisely campaigns. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's a fantastic thing, but um, there's a there's a, a question about if you if you subject this campaign to the same scientific uh, evaluation that we would do for any of our implementation strategies, how effective is it in changing practice? So Bhartia and colleagues proposed uh, a framework uh, that we could use to evaluate uh, choosing wisely campaigns. Uh, then a later publication just in 2018, Levinson and colleagues have started uh, talking about, well, does it work? What do we do to identify whether uh, this campaign is making a difference? So um, the, you will see from the subtitle, Work in Progress, uh, they are now arguing that the developing of interventions need to go beyond conversations and recommendations. Exactly what we said in the last slide, recommendations are great, these movements are great, effectively sort of top-down strategies. So how do we go beyond intervention? How, how do we develop interventions that go beyond the conversations? We need to identify whether it's actually reducing unnecessary tests and treatments at the point of care. So choose, the Choosing Wisely campaign is a, is a, is a fantastic movement. Um, it's not being as effective yet as people would like it to be. So we need more than the conversations. And this takes me to a publication by Jeremy Grimshaw, Andrea Patey and others um, in uh, last year, in 2020. Uh, uh, de-implementing wisely, proposing um, a framework uh, to develop an evidence base to reduce low-value care. So here, at last, we're getting to an a robust empirical evaluation of, uh, of strategies to reduce care. So they're proposing um, strategies that, quite interestingly, start at phase zero with uh, identify potential areas of low value care. This is about, do you have evidence that there's a problem? Um, and so it's a very important starting point. Then I'm quite interested in their phase one. Their phase one is identify local priorities. 
for implementation of choosing wisely recommendations. So how do you identify local priorities? Well, you would need to have conversations with stakeholders. And as implementation scientists, possibly this is where we have fallen down in, part, in the past over the last 20 years of implementation science. Yes, we love to devise an implementation strategy to use uh, stakeholder involvement in, that, in the development of that strategy and then to evaluate the strategy. But have we identified local priorities? Do we have local people on board who say, yeah, this is our top, this, these are in our top five um, issues that we want to deal with? And so I think that's, a, that's not just a scientific piece of work, it's almost a political piece of work. But this is about pulling our stakeholders along with us. Then phase two, and this is going to be more familiar territory because Simon French, it's based on your framework that I'm going to uh, show us all in a moment. Phase two is identifying barriers and enablers and identifying potential interventions to uh, assist in implementing those choosing wisely recommendations. So barrier identification and uh, identifying solutions to those barriers, the big piece, piece of our normal framework-based implementation science. Phase three, uh, very important, evaluating that intervention. Um, not just assuming it works, but testing it using the sorts of uh, randomised um, designs that we like to do uh, in, any, in evaluating any program. And then they go further, and that is a spreading the effective Choosing Wisely intervention uh, through that Choosing Wisely network. So that's really a sort of a, a very comprehensive, but quite, you know, quite um, a brief um, framework. It's explicitly based on Simon French's 2012 framework that I'm just showing you now, Simon French, uh, our very own Simon French, or should I say your own Simon French, and Sally Green, a very top implementation researcher at Monash. And back in 2012, Simon led this work uh, on developing theory-formed behaviour change interventions to implement Evans into practice. And this is an example of maybe the more bottom-up approach where you start with the point of care and hopefully you meet the top-down approaches in the middle by, uh, by um, complementing the work that's already been done. So the four steps from the French framework, because that's now affectionately known as, um, involves this step one, decide who needs to do what differently, what specific behaviours need to be performed and who needs to do those. Now, arguably, it's part of the prioritisation, and I'm just comparing that with, with phase one of the um, choosing wisely de-implementation framework. Uh, but do more than have the conversation with the, with the local, um, uh, uh, local um, policy makers and, and administration and management um, team. Be very specific about who needs to do what differently. And uh, Simon has, we've developed a, a framework um, to help us with, with doing that. Then identifying barriers and enablers to performing these behaviours in the healthcare context and deciding how the barriers can be overcome. You can see in the original framework, step two and three have been kind of moulded into uh, the Grimshaw phase two. And then, of course, the evaluation is a very important part of, of this work as well. So let's just step through um, the French framework a little bit more. And I'm going to go quite quickly because I do want to um, make sure we've got time for, for questions. So this is going to be a whiz through. Um, you'll know uh, many of you that uh, originally in 2005 and then with some uh, later publications in 2012, we have um, a theoretical domains framework. This is now a framework of 14 different domains that, uh, that might uh, help us to unpick and, um, and clarify what are the barriers for change that people are experiencing. And so um, it, it, it's uh, got a, a very long history in behavioural science based on 33 theories, 128 overlapping constructs that were originally distilled into 12 domains, now 14 domains in the updated framework. And it provides a list of topics to explore that might help us uh, understand 
uh, barriers and enablers to performing the behaviour. And here are the domain labels and just those domain labels again. Here are the sorts of questions we might ask. Uh, and this is um, the example of uh, acid suppression treatment for infants with gastroesophageal uh, reflux. Um, how well known is the guideline? Um, what skills are required to manage uh, this condition? Uh, what is the level of clinical consensus in the profession? And how do people feel, whether this, do people feel that this is their job um, to, to, perform, to uh, treat uh, gore differently amongst infants? Uh, do people feel confident uh, that they can appropriately treat the condition without prescribing? What are the consequences uh, if you avoid, avoid prescribing? Is there any element of unrealistic optimism about the effects of, uh, of uh, prescribing? Are there any rewards uh, for reducing this kind of prescription? At the gut level, how much do you and your colleagues really want to do this? Uh, how does it fit within people's clinical priorities? How difficult is it to decide? to do? Are there contextual factors and resource factors? What about the views of other people, are people uh, professional peers, parents, patients? Uh, what about patient distress? How does that affect uh, clinical decision making? And how do people regulate their day in the very uh, complex demands of a clinical environment to make sure that they perform the behaviour that they want to perform? Uh, so that's a, a, a whiz through the theoretical domains framework. And then we have a whole range of techniques that might address those barriers. And uh, this is the work of, uh, led by our brilliant colleague, Susan Mickey at University College London. And really, I think one of the most innovative parts of this behaviour change meal, wheel framework are the intervention functions, showing that education and training are just two of the types of functions, uh, that, that uh, types of inter interventions that we might use. And so, yes, if knowledge is a problem, let's join up the theoretical domains framework with intervention fun functions. If knowledge is a problem, yes, let's do the education. If skills are a pro problem, yes, let's do the training but quite often these aren't the problems quite often clinicians already know what they should be doing and they even want to do it and have the skills to do it but look at all the different potential sorts of interventions that we could use to support practice change depending on what the barriers and enablers are in that particular context for that particular behavior so now let's go back to um, de-implementation in particular, de-implementation in particular, and my and my and Jeremy's uh, PhD student in London now working back in Ottawa uh, worked on this um, issue uh, for an entire PhD, and, and Andrea's work is uh, is being uh, published or has been published now, including last year. So ch changing behaviour more or less, and she identified that there are some different strategies that can be used to, uh, for implementation versus the implementation. And the standout behaviour change technique that have, has been used for de-implementation is behaviour substitution. In other words, addressing Norman Swan's problem of the hardest thing to do is nothing. If you want to reduce uh, your performance of a certain behaviour, don't just do nothing, replace it with a, a substitute behaviour. Again, this is about what people have used in attempting to de-implement. We need to have more evaluation in terms of whether this is actually effective. If it's an appropriate substitute behaviour. You don't want to substitute one low value care uh, behaviour for another low value care behaviour. So, um, so let's think very carefully about what, we, uh, what is an appropriate substitute behaviour. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Um, what, are, what are some of the take home messages? Uh, we first need to identify evidence of the implementation problem. We, not, we need to think about what needs to change, who needs to do what differently instead of the low value care. And we need to think in that, in that context about what are the priorities of the local uh, um, um, administrators and managers in terms of what needs to change. What are the barriers and enablers? What techniques will address those and how can we best 
evaluate the implementation strategy, then we need to consider contextual factors in scaling the strategy. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk about that today, but that's a really quite important element. I'm going to stop there because I hope you have some questions for me. Thanks very much. Jill, thank you. I don't know whether you can hear me or not because I've had such can a nightmare now, with Steph, my technology. Thank you. <laughs> I've turned the computer on, I've turned it off several times, but I'm here. So let's see if I stay here or not. Jill, so I only heard sort of like, you know, sort of the last half, last two thirds, but fantastic presentation. Fantastic as always. I always enjoy your presentation. So um, uh, I, I no doubt sort of other people on the call have sort of got equal, um, equal praise to heap upon you. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, before I dive in with all the questions that I've, of course, got, is there anybody else on the call who has any questions that they'd like to um, to jump in with? Melissa, I can see you've just popped one in the chat. Would would you like to talk to that, Melissa, or would you are you happy if I read it out? I'm going Melissa, to... great question. Can I read it out, Steph? Please oh, do. Or... No, Melissa, go. Melissa, are you there? Go. Can't see you. Hi, Jill, loved your presentation. Um, so I was wondering, given there's lots of system that, um, systemic barriers beyond the individual clinician, um, what you think is the sweet spot between the top-down interventions that you know are important but might not be effective on their own and the individual behaviour change techniques um, and whether you think if there's not a sweet spot in the middle, should it always be a multifaceted approach, like a two-pronged approach from both sides? Thanks, Melissa. That's a great question. Um, anytime there's been an empirical study looking at multi-component versus single component implementation interventions, it seems that they don't make very much difference. So it's definitely the case that um, more is not necessarily better. However, I don't think anyone has done a study that specifically looks at the, uh, the, the top down versus bottom up. Um, my hunch is that the top down sets a context. You know, if there's a favorable context at that kind of outer context level, then the behavioral approach might well be more effective. And this is the reason for doing the local conversations with a priority setting, you know, with managers and, and CEOs and so on. Um, it sort of stands to reason that it's it's likely to, um, to make a difference. We're starting to look at organisational readiness assessments, although there's, uh, there's no evidence that we can find yet that they do make a difference to uptake. But, but, uh, but, but so that sweet spot, I don't, I think that's a great empirical question, a very complex empirical question. Um, and um, I, I'm guessing that because it's very hard to randomise healthcare systems that have got a policy, for example, versus not a policy with regard to a, to a, to a specific example of low value care, it's very hard to do this. It's got to be done more on a sort of theorised um, um, uh, uh, approach but but simply to say that I, I think it's the case that all implementation interventions uh, or in all in, 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 uh, implementation studies at least are multi um, uh, are multi um, level so uh, so, so it, it's very unusual to take one healthcare team say right and, you know, unless you've got a very localised approach, we're going to do this piece with you and we're not going to do it with anybody else. At the end of the day, though, um, if practice doesn't change at the point of care, that is, if, if clinical behaviour doesn't change, I can't see any way to, uh, to assume that the strategy has been successful. So in my mind, we use multi-level approaches to implementation, but our outcome of the implementation effort is always going to be at that behavioural level because at the point of care, if something hasn't changed and patients aren't receiving something different, then we've failed. So it's, I think it's, um, it's a bit of a combination. Not sure that there is a sweet spot. I think it's more that the top down becomes um, the contextual factor that will make it arguably, hopefully more likely that your more uh, behavioural focus um, is going to be successful like a prerequisite sort of yeah 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 and that's what we're examining with organizational readiness at the moment we're doing a systematic review of the predictive validity of organizational readiness and um 
Um, it's a very sparse literature. So again, um, people are making assumptions. They love the term mm -hmm. um, and we're doing some work that's based on some assessments, but we, we still need to, to retain our scepticism. Is it the case um, that uh, an, an organisation that's classified as ready for change actually manages the change um, more successfully? So it, it's something that we need to explore. Um, and hopefully it is a contextual factor, a background factor that will make our efforts more successful. Thank you so much. Great question. Lots more to do. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks for that response, Jill. Uh, questions are flooding into the chat as we speak. Uh, Mitch, I can see you've popped two questions in. Mitch, do you want to, um, would you like to talk to your questions? Uh, yes, uh, sorry. I um, I felt a bit sub self-conscious putting all those <laughs> questions in ahead of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Mitch. You're, you're, you're in a safe space here. I've got two, and if you can skip one if it's too much, but um, I was wondering if you could talk through the difference um, between the concept of disinvestment from health economics and de-implementation from implementation science, if there is a difference. Um, and then the second question is, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on um, how to proceed with de-implementation in situations where there's uncertainty about the evidence, so the effectiveness of an intervention given you know, there is a risk that, that we can de-implement something that was effective, but we didn't know whether it was effective. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, both great questions. Um, disinvestment. Um, thanks, Mitch. I'm not a health economist. Um, I'm going to make an assumption, and health economists here can correct me. I think they're pretty much the same with a more financial um, um, twang. Um, so... If, if something is being supported by a fan, financial strategy, um, then yes, stopping that is likely to, reducing that reward, um, as we've said, may, may help, um, but if the practice by that stage is embedded, it may not help. Disinvestment also, of course, would, talk, would refer to the investment in a huge amount of kit very expensive equipment that then um, it's very difficult not to use because that would be an admission that it was an inappropriate investment in the first place and there are all sorts of um, uh, reputational and um, you know um, turnabout kind of issues there so that's that that's a particular case I think that's very difficult um, but by and large I in my impression is that they're similar and please someone disagree with me if you know better Steph can, can I can I disagree because yeah. I, yeah. I I think I think they're they're related but I think um, that we can disinvest from things but it doesn't necessarily change the behavior it doesn't necessarily change the behavior of the clinicians doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. change the perception of the consumer. So if we think about the knee arthroscope um, example that you gave earlier, gave earlier um, that mm -hmm. I did get in for, um, that, that's still going on. And, and clinically, we know that that is something that shouldn't be done. And as you say, it's something that's no longer being supported, but we'll still see it happening um, in, in sort of hospitals, around, mm -hmm. not just around Australia. So, so I think that they're related, but I don't know that they're necessarily the same. I don't know what others think. I mean, it depends how you, how you um, yeah, I, I agree, but it, it depends how you interpret the word investment. I mean, if it's only about financial investment, yes. If someone is personally invested in something, that is, they care about it and, and, and believe in it, then, then the term has a broader meaning. So I don't know the way in which health economists use the term. It's probably more the financial one, and yes. Steph, thanks. I would agree with that. The other question, question, Mitch, about uncertainty. I mean, oh, really hard question, isn't it? Everything that we do has some level of uncertainty. Um, whenever I have, um, whenever I'm commenting on, commenting on a draft of a paper, and people use the word "ensure," we do this to ensure such and such. I cross it out and I say, "We never, we're never one hundred percent certain." I mean, in science, we measure the levels. We measure the levels of uncertainty. That's how much we're uncertain. So there's never uh, there's never a certainty. But I guess um, it's in a sense it's a definitional definitional term. If we're uncertain, 
uh, a definition, definitional issue. If we're uncertain um, that the that the practice has clinical benefit, um, we shouldn't have delivered it in the first place. If we're uncertain whether withdrawing it will have clinical benefit, um, it's just simply an example of premature um, um, implementation, isn't it? Um, but on the balance of evidence, and this is where we've got not, not the balance of evidence, we've got the balance of clinical opinion because we, ne we never have as much evidence as we'd like to have. There's not only uncertainty about about what's right to do with patient X at time Y, but even at a more esoteric level, if you like, we've got a level of uncertainty uh, of, about the clinical evidence because we've got grades of evidence, even high, high uh, levels of evidence. Um, we know that type 1 errors do occur, and, and so uh, which is the, the reason why we need to replicate um, trials in the first place. And so it, it's, a, it's a pretty tricky question, but um, it wouldn't it be nice if we worked in a health system where um, the balance of evidence was pretty clear before we started um, implementing. As, a, as for emerging evidence, which, for example, has happened in my blood transfusion example, it's very, very clear for which patient groups we should be reducing transfusions. Um, so so um, I think the, the we, in, uncertainty is something that we live with um, and there will always be that counter argument. But I think there are enough examples where it's perfectly clear that low value care is persisting. So you know, we sort of need to address it at that point. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks. They were great questions, Mitch, and, th and thanks, Jill. Um, Lauren, you're next on, on, on the list. Can I? You've got a great question about people with rare disease. Can I come to you? Thanks, Lauren. Hi, thanks. Yeah, um, hi, like, thank you for having me here. I'm um, sort of newish and, and so thinking of the very philosophical level of things. I'm on a rare disease project. And so um, I guess this, looking from that perspective, I, I had concerns that especially if we're looking at implementation strategies that might involve the sort of um, socialization or normalization of um, um, reducing low value care, that it might reduce the tendency towards, I guess, clinical risk taking or um, being willing to look outside the square, um, you know, if, if clinicians aren't rewarded for that sort of behavior, then they're more likely to, to miss things, I guess. Oh, Lauren, that's such a great question. Rare diseases are such a big problem, um, isn't it, in terms of the evidence base? And I'm reminded of my brilliant, brilliant boss when I was working at the University of Aberdeen, who then got ocular melanoma, um, is a fabulous um, trialist um, and, in, and then died of that condition. And when we were chatting about it after his diagnosis, he said, look, we, we ought to have um, a, a trial platform for all rare diseases. I, he said, because they don't know what to do with me. And everyone who's diagnosed with a rare disease ought to just automatically be, uh, be recruited to that trial. We ought to have these, um, we ought to document the risky clinic, clinical interventions that we're using uh, for, for patients. And patients need to know that it's a risky clinical intervention and they need to know that if they make no other contribution by having this condition, that they're going to be, help build um, the evidence base. So there's almost, um, yeah, yeah, there's a very philosophical, ethical issue there. Um, and, and I would have thought that the ethical imperative for rare diseases is how can we do everything possible to increase the um, solidarity, the, the, the solidarity and uh, of the evidence base? How can we bring the people with those diagnoses on board into the uh, research agenda with us and say, "Will you be our collaborator in this in this situation?" Because it's intolerable that we should not know what to do so just because you've got an rare disease. Um, uh, so, so, so I think that that is a different issue. If if people understand that we actually don't know, we do not know to, what to do with you, but let's do something based on just our theorising of your condition, um, and let's document that, and let's make sure that other people can draw on that uh, small evidence base so that it's a growing evidence base. I, I can think 
I think that's maybe the only way, but um, you'd be the expert on that, Lauren. Mm. Hopefully soon. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Lauren. And it is a challenging area, isn't it? Sort of working mm -hmm. within rare disease. And I think it's about keeping moving it forward, isn't it? Robin, can I come to you? Because you had a question that I was yeah. itching to ask as well. So I was absolutely thrilled to see you put that in there. Take it away, uh, Robin. Um Thank you, uh, Steph, and also thanks, Jill. That was a fabulous presentation. Um, you talked a lot about uh, the role of stakeholders like policymakers and clinicians in de-implementing, mm -hmm. um, but some low value care is actually driven by consumer demand. And I'm wondering how you see the consumer being involved in de-implementation and do, th do they actually have a role in it? Oh, fabulous. Top question, Robin. Thank you. And I think, to be fair, I think that is the logic behind the Choosing Wisely movement. It's let's bring the consumer into this conversation um, and let's, uh, I, I hesitate to use the term raising awareness, but um, that, because it uh, assumes that awareness is, is the only problem. Uh, but let's make, let's, let's make sure that patients are aware that actually there may be negative consequences of the additional screening and testing and, and treatment that they might be getting. And let's, uh, let's um, hook them into the conversation. Very important. Um, it's very important for, for, for ethical reasons. Let's do the investigations to see whether it's very important for effectiveness reasons as well. Um, which is the, which is what the choosing wisely movement is now looking to do. So, um, uh, anecdotally, um, of course, years and years and years ago, when I talked to a GP friend about over um, over using of antibiotics, the first thing he said was, "Well, tell my patients that," um, as though as soon as the patient demands it, he's got to do it, right? So there's, a, there's got to be a collaborative piece here uh, wh whereby um, GPs, and we've done this, do the reality check with patients. They don't necessarily want it. What they want is treatment with symptom relief. But, but you know, if, G if GPs don't understand that, then they'll think the patient is um, grateful for the antibiotic, for example. Um, but... Um, let's treat that, uh, let's bring state, uh, consumers and other stakeholders in uh, as much as we can, but let's treat that strategy with the same level of scepticism that we treat every strategy. That is, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good thing to do, but let's, let's test whether it actually makes a difference to, to clinical practice. Did you want to come back to me, Robin? Because I, I Oh, no, it's just, I was just sort of thinking like with a lot of consumers, like say they go to a GP, like they don't really, really, really feel they've actually received care unless they receive something. So the idea of like not getting something and, you know, um, you know, I, I mean, I liked your idea of the substitute behaviour, like maybe if there's a substitute something, you know, they would still feel they've received value. I mean, that's sort of one side of it. And the other side is the time value in that, for a GP, yes. like you can prescribe something in a minute or two, but if you're going to explain yes. to a patient why they shouldn't be totally. getting something they're used to, it might take yes. you 20 minutes. So, yeah. That's that completely, a that's so much a barrier. And that's where uh, for antibiotic prescribing, um, it, it has been suggested that what you what you can do, what the GP can do, is write uh, an over the name of an over-the-counter over the counter symptom relief um, medication on a bit of paper and give that to the patient. It feels like they're being given a prescription. Um, it also has some other functions because handing over that bit of paper signals the end of the consultation, right? So the GP needs to get the patient out of the room because there's 10 other patients waiting. And so we need to have a look at within the context, what are the other functions of that behavior? And can we tick the box on some of those other functions? And will the patient still be happy? And I think if you did an exit interview with patients who've been given uh, some advice about symptom relief, on a bit of paper that they can take away from them. It would be very interesting to see if they feel just as happy that they've actually been treated um, in the way that the ones who get a prescription feel that they've been treated. I realise that, yeah, that is um, in, in the Australian system where the patient is likely to go up the road to the next GP, uh, which can't happen in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, but in the Australian setup, I, 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 I um, accept that that is something to consider and I think uh, yeah I, I agree with you I think the substitute behavior might be the way to go for that one. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Jill, for such a such a fulsome answer on, on that, that role of sort of consumers there. We have got a few juicy questions left in the chat, but I'm afraid we're, we're at time and uh, I'm always loath to keep people over time. So can I just say thank you very much, Jill, for um, presenting to our group today and, and thank you, everybody, for your questions and discussion. I think it's it's that combination that makes this group so so interesting to have that interaction. So um, yeah, so once again, Jill, I think we may well be inviting you back to be presenting on another topic in the future. So uh, thank you so much, <laughs> and thank you for your very thoughtful responses and and questions. And um, as we've said, as, as we've said, there's no definitive answers, but it's um, we could get closer. We can get closer to the solutions. So thanks very much for the invitation. A pleasure to meet you all. Fabulous. Toodaloo, everybody. Thank you.